it is my great pleasure to begin the next session uh, to, by introducing Guillermo Suarez Tanguil. Is that close enough? Uh, great. Um, uh, to speak about measuring the crypto mining malware ecosystem, a decade of unrestricted wealth and profit, the real criminal usage of Monero. Come on. All right. Um, thank you very much. For me, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to, to, to be here today uh, talking about my work. Um, so just to give a bit of uh, background, I'm an assistant professor at uh, King's College London. Um, uh, sorry, I'm not sure if we can get the slides. Good. Um, and I've been basically working on uh, different aspects of cybersecurity for the last 10 years, but I focus a lot uh, over the last uh, few years uh, on malware detection in, in general. Uh, and in particular, I've been actually working on, um, yeah, I've been, over the last year, I've been working on uh, crypto mining malware, okay? Together with a colleague at Carlos III University of Madrid, Sergio Pastrana, uh, we are um, constantly updating our numbers, so this is an ongoing work, and, and we are very excited to bring today some of our preliminary results. Um, and, um, Basically, um, if you guys want to have a link of the paper, you'll have the white paper over here so you can uh, get a bit more details of what we are uh, doing. Um, so to give a bit of uh, background, um, to the, nowadays uh, malware is a, is a real problem. So there is more malware than ever before. Uh, and I used to have here a slide that uh, saw the amount of malware that was actually uh, uh, discover that was actually detected um, every year. And I was also uh, typically putting the uh, predictions for the next year. And all of a sudden, I got tired of updating uh, the same trend every year and every year. So I decided to put, uh, to put this uh, plot. So basically, uh, every new year, we have much more malware than, than, than what is expected in the, in the industry. And to give you a really like, brief high level of, of what, is, uh, what are the figures, uh, this is a bit updated. But Kasperky Labs uh, has reported that they automatically automatically process about 300,000 malicious files per day. So these are binaries that have been this, uh, detected already, have been flagged as, as malware, but, uh, but they are just uh, uh, coming up uh, as, as, as new binaries in, in, into their labs. So um, it is obvious that uh, malware is, uh, is, is, is a huge problem, okay? And, and there are three main, uh, or four main factors that are contributed to this. Uh, one of them is that it introduces uh, massive revenues, as we'll see uh, a bit later. But uh, one perhaps key factor uh, of the development of this phenomenon is that there is an increasing trend on the automatization uh, and actually developing uh, new malware samples in a very inexpensive uh, way. And perhaps uh, this might be related to uh, some uh, code reused uh, oriented techniques that we have been observed also in the, in the malicious industry, which allows malware developers to uh, create or stitch together a brand new samples of malware by putting a few uh, propagation engines, a component or an exploit for another malware into a brand new sample uh, just only with a few clicks. Um, so it is obvious that uh, malware nowadays is a matter of uh, data analytics, okay? And, and that's basically what we've been doing over the last uh, couple of years in my lab. And um, uh, to understand a bit better how this phenomenon works and to kind of reinforce this notion that I mentioned about the software development techniques, uh, basically malware developers uh, tend to gather in the underground uh, markets, and this is precisely where uh, all these uh, services and all these uh, kind of uh, uh, places in which uh, criminals can purchase specialized uh, uh, elements of the uh, malware economy, uh, they all gather there. And uh, I like to see the underground markets as a, as a form of uh, pure capitalism, where uh, different uh, malware developers try new techniques, they test, and they uh, see how it goes. And if they prove profitable, uh, they are basically uh, adopted by others. And there is uh, an increasing trend on the commoditization of, uh, of, of these services. And I brought with me here a snapshot of how the underground economy works. So basically, this is a taxonomy of the different actors, and there are two main elements to understand. One of them is the, what they call the profit centers, uh, which basically are a number of uh, products or a number of elements that allow um, a lot of victims to introduce new capital into the underground economy. Okay? And, all hanging on top of this, there is something that we call the support centers, which is a number of services that actually enable these uh, these uh, these elements. All these support centers are actually 
uh, 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 they are interconnected. So some of these uh, uh, elements that you can see on top of the chart, for example, spam bots or click bots, they sometimes rely on uh, malware distribution services or traffic and, uh, acquisition services on some raw material like uh, hosting and uh, networking. An example might be, for example, something that they call paper install services, in which you basically can go to one of these places and rent 1,000 machines and install your software on top, uh, on top of those machines for, for a few dollars. And uh, this is precisely why this is relevant to us uh, today. Um, because there has been an increasing trend in the underground economy uh, of um, using uh, what is called illicit crypto mining, which basically is uh, nothing more than uh, using illicit uh, stolen resources to, to, to mine cryptocurrencies. And, and, and typically these are distributed through botnets, as, as, as we uh, were discussing at the end of last talk in one of the questions that, uh, that someone raised. Um, as of also, to state a bit the obvious, um, whether this is worth it or not, the question also has been uh, solved in, in, in the previous uh, talks by, by Kristen and also uh, Howard, when we were talking about uh, how acid-resistant cryptocurrencies uh, enable um, end users with vanilla PCs or not with a lot of power comp uh, computation to uh, be able actually to contribute towards the protocol. Okay. So perhaps not stating so much the obvious, uh, we have also seen, at least uh, over the last uh, few years, the industry have observed that uh, crypto mining malware, illicit crypto mining, has been funding the, the different profit centers. And this is important because, uh, as we were discussing over lands, uh, crypto mining seemed to be actually the, the least uh, problematic of all the possible uses that a bond might be doing. But this is not always uh, true because uh, all these profit centers uh, actually uh, foster more crime and enable other uh, more sophisticated uh, um, attacks like, for example, financial malware and so on and so forth. Um, so in order, just with, with this whole thing uh, in mind, I brought with me today a number of uh, research questions that I wanted to uh, walk you through uh, um, um, in the next few set of lies. So basically, we are interested on knowing, uh, getting to know what are the preferred cryptocurrencies mined by uh, criminals, uh, what is the role of the underground economy, and what are the different tools and techniques uh, adopted, uh, how many actors are they involved, and how can we better understand uh, what are the, uh, the, the f financial profits that they are gaining. And what is the sophistication of the tools that they are doing, and what are the countermeasures that we uh, that we, that we can implement? Uh, so basically, uh, we started doing a measurement of uh, a number of underground markets, and in particular, we uh, analyzed automatically like about 48 million uh, posts from some of uh, those underground markets, and we found really interesting things. This is, for example, the, uh, the image that we have here, a flyer that you can find in the underground economy, and you can see how criminals are investing time on making something catchy, because uh, basically, they just by creating this flyer, they are attracting uh, new customers, and, and basically, you can see here someone advertising saying, okay, start your own botnet right now. You will be getting a silent miner that would allow you to make here a number of features, as you can observe uh, uh, on, on the slide. Um, so digging a bit further, analyzing these 48 million posts, we found that uh, criminals are actually purchasing inexpensive and sophisticated uh, uh, mining tools. So for example, uh, out of all the services that they've been offered, uh, we observed that there were, like the average cost of an encrypted monero was 35 US dollars. So someone that actually uh, did it and that doesn't know anything about this can get one of these uh, binaries and start mining uh, uh, basically uh, um yeah, uh, on the fly. We also observed that people in the underground economy was even offering miners for free. Uh, just They were just only getting a cutoff of, of, of the profits. And they were also offering uh, vouch copies. Uh, they also offer customized services, like for example, adding new stealthy techniques like either mining or just uh, 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 some elements that would enable the miner to stop mining when there is a user present on, 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 on the machine, right? In order to evade detection. And there is also an increase in support. So they give you an offer. They, they give you a, one of these binaries, and they uh, explicitly say, OK, I can guarantee you that this binary is not detected by this number of antivirus uh, systems. Okay, And if you get caught, actually, you get updates. You get updates, and you get a brand new software that um, after adding uh, whatever new feature, like, for example, this anti uh, emulation uh, thing that they mentioned in one of these posts, uh, later they, they basically explicitly say that this is fully undetected uh, uh, binary. Okay. 
So uh, now we have, uh, we see how easy for these criminals is to get to mine, okay? Nothing, nothing new because actually it's not very difficult to get a, a miner from GitHub and start doing it yourself. But um, what happens when you want to actually rent a botnet or when you want to actually to, to buy? I was mentioning before about paper install and these are some of the figures, how, how much does it cost for you to rent uh, or to install 1,000 uh, of your binaries in the underground economy? Between $1,000 uh, and, and, and $10, depending on the type of uh, machine that you Want to, that you want to rent, okay? Um, so digging a bit further into this uh, economy, we were interested in getting to know what are uh, people in the underground economy talking uh, in terms of cryptocurrencies. And in particular, we were looking at different uh, cryptocurrencies of, uh, me by measuring the number of uh, posts in which some cryptocurrency has been, uh, has been mentioned and the number of new uh, posts in which this is mentioned. And we can see here that Monero uh, has been on the rise in the underground markets, at least in, num in, in terms of number of posts in which people is talking about this, uh, this cryptocurrency. Uh, so a bit motivated by this, I'm going to show you what we actually uh, uh, went about uh, and trying to understand a bit better this, uh, this, uh, this economy. So basically we created a system that allows us to uh, automatically analyze different uh, malware. So basically we started by getting a feed of malware and trying to make sure that these executables are actually um, malware and they are actually miners. And after that we apply something that is called a static and dynamic analysis to extract uh, basically a number of things from, from from these elements. And we uh, analyze automatically the binaries, as I said, using program analysis and other type of techniques uh, to uh, basically get uh, uh, things like the wallets, for example, or the pools in which these miners are connecting to. And also we are interested in other type of uh, metadata. And we have two different uh, um, task over here that we call campaign analysis, which basically allows us to associate each of these samples to the wallet addresses, to the pools in which they are connecting to, the IP addresses, and something that we call drop uh, files, which is very relevant in the paper install scheme, which is uh, uh, one of the key uh, uh, services used uh, by, by some of these criminals. Also DNS queries which are very relevant. We also do something that is called profit analysis that I'll explain in the next slide a bit better what, what is it about, and something that is called aggregation that I also brought a, a slide with, uh, with me. Uh, overall, we analyzed like about 4 million uh, malware samples, uh, and about of, uh, of those 1.1 were actually miners or ancillary files uh, used for, for mining. So this is the, all the number of wallets that we found uh, in, in malware, okay? Um, we can clearly see that Monero is actually uh, uh, the, the largest number of wallets that we saw in malware was actually from, from, from Monero. So what we did actually is we went about uh, looking at uh, all the different uh, transparent pools that were actually uh, connecting from, from these malware samples and tried to get for each of these wallet addresses uh, the number of the payments, the rewards that these pools actually were giving to these uh, uh, miners. Interestingly enough, some of these pools are so transparent that I also give you the timestamp in which these payments have been given, which allow us to actually uh, also understand the timeline of these uh, uh, of, uh, of these uh, scammers. Um, as I mentioned before. Um, Common cryptocurrencies that, like Monero that obfuscate transactions make very difficult to understand how many actors are behind this element. You might know how many wallets or how many samples, but it's difficult to understand a bit better the actors. So what we did is uh, we created a number of heuristics that would allow us to understand uh, not only uh, samples alone, but also campaigns and how uh, all these samples actually work together. I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, explaining them, but perhaps the most simple one for you to understand is that what happens when uh, three or ten different uh, binaries use the same wallet. So if they use the same wallet, most likely it's the same actor, right? So we connected that, we created a graph, and we started mining the graph to try to understand a bit better uh, this uh, ecosystem, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna jump to the results of what we got after uh, doing this uh, measurement. Um, okay, so Overall, we discovered like 2,000 campaigns, and when by when looking at the different uh, the common uh, and the different domains that these malware samples were connecting to, we understand we realized a number of things uh, that are worth mentioning. First of all, that these uh, by, uh, miners were uh, actually using some easy or uh, not very sophisticated evasion techniques, like for example, using DNS domain aliases in order to not connect directly to the pools in order to uh, avoid a bit of uh, um, network detection. And when looking at the uh, 
uh, different um, DNS requests and how these associate to the different command and control uh, 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 botnets, known botnets, we realized that there are three main botnets that have been very active in this domain. One is the uh, Evil Miner botnet, which is uh, on the top of these botnets that uh, use uh, different uh, wallets in order to uh, mine Monero. And this is the figures that we were getting. Like this, uh, um, the bots from this botnet were uh, have been making uh, um, about 60, uh, 16,000 uh, uh, Moneros uh, altogether so far. Uh, there are a number of other known botnets, but also we observed that they were uh, not all the domains were actually related to uh, known um, botnets. Okay, so we went about analyzing all the campaigns individually, and we found um, a new infrastructure, something uh, things that the community uh, was was not aware uh, of. And we, in particular, uh, I brought with me this case study of something that we call uh, we called name uh, the Free Booth campaign, basically because they were using uh, a domain name called Free Booth, and altogether this campaign actually made a, a huge amount of, uh, of uh, money. Worth noting that uh, when looking at the different, uh, the different payments uh, made by each of the wallets in this campaign, we observe a few things that uh, using the same wallet, but also using uh, different wallets from the same campaign, we observe that these miners were uh, using at the same time different pools, meaning that they were competing with themselves, which is, might seem counterintuitive. Uh, but later we understood immediately that this is a countermeasure, it's a way uh, that they use in order to uh, um, be more resilient to take down strategies, okay? Actually here in the timeline we can see, uh, in the picture in, 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 in the first line, we can see uh, when the proof of uh, works have changed, and the picture in the blue line we can see, uh, we, 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 uh, we can see when we reported these wallets to some of these pools, okay? And we clearly see that both uh, proof of works but also when we reported these wallets, deter this type of, uh, of, of cyber threat. Um, basically, uh, interestingly enough, we saw that uh, when we reported, for example, um, this uh, uh, illicit um, activity to mine uh, XMR, for example, uh, we realized that miners immediately started moving to other pools that they were uh, uh, less cooperative in, the, in this regard. Um, but it's important to note as well, because we discussed this before, that the proof of works are very uh, problematic for, for, for this type of criminals, basically because when they need to update their marble samples, they need to pay again. And for them, that actually makes uh, um, um, kind of has an impact on their infrastructure, okay? Um, okay, so this is basically uh, the top 10 campaigns and more or less the timeline in which they operated and the amount of uh, uh, Monero that they've been uh, mining, which give us a rough idea of how much uh, this ecosystem is actually uh, uh, making. Actually, if you account for the total amount of uh, Monero that they have uh, extracted, this more or less accounts for 4.5% po of the entire Monero in circulation, which is uh, quite a, a huge chunk of it. Um, Okay, so by looking at the prevalence of three different elements uh, um, and how they correlate with the different campaigns, we also managed to make an, a number in, of interesting uh, findings. So the first one is uh, we, we were looking at the number of samples. We saw that at least 92 percent of the campaigns were using less than 10 samples, okay? Of course, all these samples can be installed in different machines, uh, so that this is actually doesn't uh, tell us much, but it tells us that antivirus vendors are not making a huge effort on detecting these uh, malware samples because campaigns doesn't need to have like a really large amount of samples to actually be able to, to, to run this uh, business. We also observe that uh, about 99 percent of the campaigns use only 30 wallets or less, which also gives us an idea of uh, how much efforts are putting pools into banning these wallets because if they were like banning botnet-like activity, they would actually ha be having like a huge number of wallets per, per campaign rather than having a few. And also we observed that about 90% of the campaigns were making only 100 Moneros out of the 7,000 that we have, 700,000 that we have observed, which basically tells us that the core of this illicit business has been monopolized by a really small number of wealthy uh, actors, which is actually a problem and it goes against the uh, centralization and decentralization uh, discussions that we've been having uh, over the last uh, couple of uh, days, okay? Um, really quickly, jump into, um, um, jump into the success of the different bots and reiterating the, uh, the problematic of why different, uh, why the same campaign is actually using more than one pool to, to mine, putting all their bots. Uh, we were interested in getting to know two different uh, uh, people, basically. Uh, those campaigns, the losers that we call, uh, those ones that are making really uh, little amount of money, and we observed that the losers were making one, uh, were only mining mostly in one pool. Okay, that doesn't mean that the champions, uh, uh, all of the champions actually uh, mining in, in more than 
than one pool. Uh, actually, we can observe here that about 25% of the campaigns uh, that make a huge amount of money were mining uh, in, in seven pools, about uh, 15 or 17 in five pools, but a huge chunk of them, like more than 40%, were also using only one pool. Okay, so there are different dynamic strategies. Uh, it's clear enough that using one pool can actually mean that you are very successful, but also means that uh, if you only use one pool and you're not, you don't know very well what you are doing, chances are that you're gonna be um, uh, uh, detected and taken down uh, easier. Also, we were interested uh, looking at the success, uh, the success of the uh, of, of the different campaigns from the different angles. So basically, we look at uh, different elements of uh, the underground economy. How does this map with the numbers that we observe? So in particular, we were interested in getting to know how many of these actors were uh, using uh, paper installed services uh, that you can buy in underground uh, economies, mining software as well that they were uh, renting in these uh, elements. Also, which obfuscation techniques they were using and proxies. And, and ways in which they, uh, um, yeah, they can remain undetected and the period of activity. So basically, we've got here that the medium actors, the ones that, that are doing average, they use known packers. They also use uh, known mining software. And they started very recently in the last uh, year, most of them, at least 60% uh, of them. Uh, on the other hand, the people that are actually making huge amount of money, we can see that they are using paper install services, they are using more sophisticated techniques like C names or uh, proxy servers. They avoid using known packers, uh, meaning that they know how to obfuscate things properly, and they also have been around for uh, four years. Okay. Um, so just bringing to the end of the uh, presentation uh, a brief discussion about the countermeasures. Uh, basically, countermeasures that are applicable on, uh, currently, they are not um, working um, um, they are not working uh, very well. Uh, we discuss about different anomaly detection techniques, not only um, as, as part of, for example, power anomaly detection techniques, but about, uh, about uh, whether uh, changes on the proof of work or having like more RAM into uh, into these servers might allow you to actually detect this type of uh, threat. But truth, truth is that if you're a rootkit, you might be able to actually fake these uh, numbers and give the perspective to the user that you're using uh, uh, less resources than you're doing. Uh, so what is next? We have observed that the different criminals are just pointing and, and going for the long hanging fruit. Uh, what happens if uh, the different criminals, instead of actually trying to aim for the reward for the different minings, they start cheating and they start uh, targeting 51% uh, uh, type of attacks? There are recent academic papers that have shown that 51% uh, type of attacks are not worth it because you need to spend more electricity and more money trying to achieve the attack than, than the reward that you're getting. But what if you're not paying for the electricity? You're a bonnet and, you, and you're just using someone else's electricity. Okay, so this brings me to the uh, conclusions. Uh, very quickly, we have observed that Monero is the preferred cryptocurrency in the underground economy, that uh, the underground economy plays an important role, and that the actors are um, like making huge profits, and also uh, there is a small core business model uh, run by um, very sophisticated actors in, uh, in, in this behalf. Um, so sorry for rushing on the last few slides. I was just getting uh, a hand on the time, so thanks a lot, and I'll be happy to take any questions. I was just curious uh, if you made any attempt at attribution for who's kind of conducting these things. It's kind of a meme that there's like North Korean government, you know, crypto mining hmm. via malware, or if it's like one dude in Eastern Europe somewhere. So, so we are working on that, but I should say that after spending a few months working on better ways to attribute things, I should say that that's a very challenging uh, topic, um, mainly because over the last few years we have uh, learned that uh, several uh, sophisticated uh, actors are uh, very well are mimicking other uh, other actors. So the fact that you might see some features that might uh, allow, might you. Um, conclude that this kind of binary might have been compiled here or there, or might have some, uh, I don't know, fingerprints from North Korea, they could well be faked and could actually be some other random actor. But it's an interesting research question and, and the community is very interested in that. Yeah? Um, my question, oh, together Mike, thank you. My question is, do you have a breakdown of the operating systems that the malware is actually running on? I mean, um, what are we dealing with between, say, Windows, Android, um, GNU Linux, Mac, iOS. We did. Um, 
we, we did some uh, an, a small analysis. I don't remember on top of my head, but we didn't report them because basically the, uh, the, we were looking at the number of binaries that we were having, how they were compiled. Uh, most of them were uh, targeting Windows and Linux uh, systems. Uh, not a lot uh, were ARM uh, or meant for, uh, uh, for Android devices. But truth is that it's really difficult as well to jump to conclusions because uh, we have 1.1 million binaries, but we don't know how many installations each of these binaries have. So it's, it's really tricky. Okay. Thank you very much then.